I think there's a kink or a flaw in how humans see the world. Uh, and it's simple, uh, or it's simply expressed. We tend to disregard regular, slow, incremental progress. What we want to see is categorical change. Mm. It used to be X, now it's Y. <laughs> Not, well, we're 90% of the way towards Y. No, it's got to be one thing or the other. And if you give people problem-solving tasks uh, of varieties of different types, uh, uh, you know, they, they solve them on the computer, um, and you ask them to rate their progress, they will throw away any answers that haven't solved the problem completely. Uh, solving it 80% of the way is actually pretty good, you know, um, but what we tend to have is this uh, kink in the way we think where we let what will be the perfect solution mm. be the enemy of the good enough solution. Um, and uh, I, I draw the contrast between these two different approaches, uh, but I, I, I center it really around this idea that uh, humans really, again, I guess we've limited bandwidth, uh, we've limited capacity to process things through time, uh, all, all that kind of thing. We want to see that it's totally changed. And actually, um, the reality of economics is things like demography move slowly, you know, um, uh, you, you will get our changes in, in literacy. It's not something you can wave a magic wand over. What you're hoping to see is a gradual and steady progress. You know, Ireland hit 100% literacy, I guess, 100 years ago. Uh, Afghanistan, I guess, might hit it in 50 years' time. Who knows? But, you know, when you, you plot the curves towards educational attainment, uh, for example, what you see is, is there's no magic wands here. Mm. Uh, just slow, steady, incremental improvement over time. Uh, and that I think we have a difficulty in seeing life in those terms, because what we don't do is think about time series data. <laughs> you know, we don't, don't go to our world and data and, and look what's happened over the last 50 years in terms of um, uh, child deaths on the road through traffic accidents. We, we want to wave a wand and make the problem go away. But actually, it, it you know if you want to if you want to do something like reduce traffic injuries you've got to have lots and lots of small changes in behavior in how we design our transport system in speed in the design of cars so that they've got effective crumple zones in speed limits in in uh, built up neighborhoods there's 101 things to do and then you will see over a period of time a gradual decrease uh you know like obviously we can turn the the, the tap off in terms of road traffic deaths really easily mm. by just uh, forbidding anybody to drive. But th that's not going to be a, a solution that most people will reach for. Mm. Um, nations begin as conversations. Massive central theme in the book. How are how are countries cognitive constructs? Yeah. So um, my starting point, really, uh, when I when I was writing this book, was uh, he's he's kind of not terribly well known in Ireland, but the Irish political scientist Benedict uh, Anderson, mm. um, who spent his academic career mostly in the U.S. but worked on on issues to do with with Southeast Asia, uh, he he was a persona non grata in Indonesia for thirty years because uh, he campaigned for uh, uh, a democracy in uh, in 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 Indonesia. Uh, anyway, that's a by the by. Uh, but his, his central question is this. If you think about a place like Indonesia, it's an archipelago consisting of hundreds of islands. Um, and uh, it extends over a considerable geographic area. How does something like that come together? And Anderson's claim is, I think, the central one in thinking about nationalism, that um, people have to engage in an active imagination together, defining what their nation is where their nation stops, starts, where the borders are, all of those kinds of things. Um, and his claim is, that he makes re some really interesting claims uh, that nationalism, for example, couldn't have existed before the written word. Uh, it couldn't have existed uh, before um, the widespread uh, advent of literacy or the gradual change in literacy. Um, and he also makes lots of claims to do with with who is the certain source of knowledge around you? And that, that changed in Europe dramatically between, you know, the 12th century and the, and the 15th century. Suddenly, 
God was no longer at the center of the universe because of Copernicus. Suddenly the earth was a, just a sphere <laughs> going around the sun. Uh, so we, we were decentered in, in all sorts of ways. Um, but the, the core point that uh, Anderson and others uh, who followed on from him make is that we have to imagine the community together. Mm. I don't know many people in Donegal, but uh, they will be Irish to me. They will be part of the Irish nation. And our definition of what the nation is changes over time. Um, of course, and necessarily, no no nation is is set in stone. And I, you know, there are lots of examples. Uh, depending on on uh, the uh, list you look at, there have been something like thirty new countries have come into being since nineteen ninety. Um, uh, and Czechia and Slovakia is a really good example. Where there was one, there is now two uh, two separate nations, and that that's in Europe. And uh, you know, we may see in our lifetime. Uh, this island uh, become a single nation. I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but it's certainly a conversation. And that's the point. Mm. <laughs> it's out there as a conversation. And the the, the kind of missing point uh, with Anderson, and, and this is not a, you know, a deep criticism of him, is that he, he doesn't talk about imagination and how we exercise it together as a collective psychological faculty that is allowed us because of how our brains are built mm. and our brains are built to work together collectively we talk all the time like you and i are, are talking at the moment mm. we're able to imagine things together and you know if if the there are lots of examples but let's go back to a, a an old example when uh uh the united states hadn't yet come into being there were lots of conversations uh about what that nation should look like. And the Federalist Papers is a, is a really good example of, of how a conversation happened about what a nation should look like. Uh, no king, there will be a president. <laughs> that president will be voted for uh, and he will be limited in office. And it was a he and only certain people could vote for him. But compared to what went before, <laughs> and this is a good example of incremental progress, that was absolutely dramatic um, that uh, we can vote somebody in <laughs> And we can chuck them out. Um, and that's written down in the Federalist Papers in the 1770s. Um, you know, a, a really remarkable thing to do. We will not have hereditary rule anymore. Our new nation uh, will be set up. We will be self-governing. Uh, we will choose our own leaders. We will vote for our own leaders. And we will hoof these guys out. And uh, uh, lots of nations have taken their cue from that since then. But it began as a conversation, you know, Benjamin Franklin and his friends sitting down together, <laughs> having a discussion about what was wrong and how they will put it right, how they will get these guys out, how the uh, the, uh, uh, the war, because they knew there would have to be a war, uh, would be prosecuted. Happy New Year, everybody. That's a short clip from episode 27 with Professor Shane O'Mara. The subscribe button should be right about down here and a link to the full episode should be right about here. Have a great 2024.